Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We are on the final stage of the journey. Who's been here for the whole journey? Hands up. Nice. So we are entering what was chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, the Koheleth. And the Koheleth has some very encouraging and words of wisdom and sobering words of wisdom. Who found the video of the donkey a little sobering? Hands up. It's a bit of a reminder, isn't it? Can donkeys teach us anything? Yeah. It's a great shadow picture the Father's given us. We're going to finish this up today and, um, and just take the final words and the wisdom from this incredible book uh, and just have a look at some of the things that it's trying to get across to us. Uh, but first, we'll just uh, quickly say truth of, uh, oh, sorry, the journey of last session. Truth does not return. Boy, it doesn't come back empty. So we, who wants to have the truth in us? Yeah. We also looked at a little bit of our references to the lost or scattered tribes of Israel. Um, the chapter also got a bit sobering, you know, that stuff just happens, doesn't it? And we don't have control of everything, do we? You know, what are you going to do about it? Especially if you don't have control. We also looked at if you're going to do things, what was the Koheleth? He was encouraging us to not just do it, but to go the extra mile, right? And, of course, we see the encouragement to do that in the Brit Hadashah in the New Testament. So, um, And then we looked at the parable of the sower of the seed and uh, the parable of the mustard seed and what Yeshua was trying to give us as he was speaking the great truths behind the mysteries and the parables to allow them to look further. And those who would be able to hear uh, could hear and understand those truths. Um, enjoy life yeah. while we're alive. Seeing the sun is a good thing, right? Even though we're in a temporary place, we still got time to work this all through and make the decisions that the Father would have us contemplate and make in our lives. Wisdom. The wisdom of starting your task early and staying focused. And remember we talked about the winds of doctrine blowing and not to get caught up in all that sort of thing. And how this can actually distract us when we're caught up in different doctrines, even conspiracy theories, all this kind of thing. Where there's noise going on in people's heads and they cannot see the basic truth um, that's sitting before us, but also the deeper truths. And so we can miss um, his life... Uh, his living word actually sanctifying and helping to circumcise our hearts on this journey. Um, to rejoice, joy in the fire. Remember we, we spoke a little bit how it's amazing how we can experience a joy that surpasses all understanding. If we actually can be in a place of repentance in the fires of our lives. The Father does not leave us. And in fact, I have found in the fires of my life, I'd never been so close to him. But I, in that place, and, and, and we spoke about this last week, we can choose not to be in repentance when we're in our fires, can't we? So it's nice to be around a family that encourages us to stay in a place of repentance. Has anybody ever found it sometimes that uh, we can appreciate some help to stay in repentance at times in our lives? Yeah. And uh, this is why we want to appreciate the donkeys around us while we are here. Um. And then, of course, a little bit of the consequences of a misspent youth. Unfortunately, I have far too many examples on that front to reflect on my life. Um, but basically, it's, you know, we can fill our boots and we can do this, but they will catch up with us. It does catch up with us and we will face the decisions we made as a part of our youth, especially if it was not uh, focusing on the Father and his ways. And then, of course, the anxiety that can come out of those consequences later on in our lives, um, it can be a result of it. Real anxiety. And that was spoken about in earlier chapters uh, in Ecclesiastes. And there was no room for the Father. What's the one thing that there's no room for in our life? There's a time for everything, but what? Anxiety. anxiety. So we want to enter into Teshuvah so that this is allowed to leave us and shalom his shalom comes into our lives we find a greater peace we learn to walk with one another we're not perfect we make mistakes right i like to say that you don't find out the true character of a person when things are going well 
You want to walk with somebody, you'll find out the true character of a person when things aren't going so well. Has anybody been in a time when things aren't going so well and you maybe saw some things in yourself that you're going, even a surprise to you? I couldn't put my hand down for that. Those are revealing times. And this is why we want to be in Teshuva. Teshuva, repentance, um, and metanoia in the Greek. We want to be in this place where we're turned to the Father because he does show us some incredible things about ourselves. But the great thing that we can do if we're willing to live in a place of Teshuva is we come together as a family like this of donkeys and we spend this time with each other and we start to see what the Father's doing in all of us and the wisdom and the things that we're all overcoming in different fronts. And collectively, that helps us. To, to be a part of what the Father's done in each of our lives. Nobody in this room doesn't have anything or something to give to another brother or sister who's, who has overcome a position in anything. And this is why we want to be in a pattern of discipleship and in fellowship and, and to indeed come together so that we can uh, enjoy in each other's oil. The, uh, the oil that comes as a result is the crushing of our lives. The olive press. The great spiritual olive press. So, we move on. And the last statement of this, haval means vapor, breath, smoke, mist, fleeting, temporary. So we're going to discuss this final stage, that even though all that we're experiencing in the shadow picture may be temporary, it's still means something to the Father, doesn't it? And along the way, it means something to us. And so we just got to get these things in balance and priorities right in our lives along the way. And uh, some of those priorities were mentioned by Chris and uh, by Louis this morning that, you know, if we get the priority right in our lives, especially as a family structure and whatnot, then that love comes down in the right way. It flows through the correct way. And so that's very important. Okay, when all is said and done is what we're chap- uh, is what I've titled this final chapter. When it's all done, and we're just going to look at some uh, some interesting things along the way here with this one. Um, I want you to um, open up with me. We'll go to uh, verse one of chapter twelve, and we'll just see what the Kahilath is going to wrap this up with. He's going to go. Remember. Has everybody got their Bibles open? Remember, also your Creator in the days of your youth. So remember Him in the days of your youth. And if you do, does that bring less or more consequences later down the track for you? Less. There's a blessing to having the Creator as a part. So who here wants their kids to have a clear understanding of the Creator and His ways now? Who here would have liked an opportunity to have been raised that way? Hmm. Okay. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the guards of the house tremble and the strong men shall bow down, when the grinders shall cease because they are few and those that look through the windows shall become dim and the doors shall be shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low and the one who rises up at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song are bowed down. I'm just going to stop there at the end of verse 4. What the Kehilas is saying here is the evil days of growing old. Yeah. When no longer are even the sounds of life clear. When we even lose our hearing. When we get bowed down. When a strong man, once in the youth of his life, is now hunched over. What would it be like for a man who could protect and be with his family, especially in the days that these were written, protect his family, his wife, his kids, 
now no longer has the capacity to do that in the dawning golden years of their life, the last years of life. The Kehillah says these are evil. But they are temporary. Even our old age is not eternal. Our youth is not eternal. No matter what we do with it. None of this shadow picture, as we understand it, it's all temporary. Does everybody think that not being old for eternity is a good thing? Can we praise y'all for that? Isn't that neat? Does everybody think being young your whole life? Who here would like to be five years old forever? (laughs) Mark's got his hand up. (laughs) You see... If we really, if we're really to take this into its proper perspective, the reason why the Kehillah is saying it's evil is because at the end of the day, all that we experience, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, this, this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is because we experience a lot of things in the shadow picture that uh, perhaps aren't so pleasant along the way. We've also contributed to some unpleasant things in this shadow picture from each and every one of us in this room. Everybody in this room has contributed to the reality of a fallen state and how we interact, how we are with each other in both good and bad ways, the character of who we are. Remember, remember this well, please. It is not when things are going all your way that your true character is seen. Your true character is seen when all of it is understood and walked with. And that means, what does your character look like when things aren't going your way? What does it look like when your character is in the dawning days of its life? I know even the testimony of when my mom passed away and the hospice workers and what they said to me. They used to fight over who could look after my mother. And one of the reasons they explained to me why that was is because in the last days of somebody's lives, you are going to see the very best or the very worst of a human character there is. And they said to me that your mother is a joy for us to be around as she's dying. I'm not just saying that because it's my mother. That was their words. But I can tell you this much. I was not surprised. She was an incredible woman. And I've only fully realized that the older I've got because you realize how much you don't know. We have a choice to allow a sanctification in our life now. Whatever stage of life we're in, be it young, be it old, right? Right? We have a choice to make now to allow the Holy Spirit to do a job on our hearts. To give that permission to a father for the sanctification of our lives. And that choice is yours to make with him. Where the sovereignty of man and the sovereignty of God will meet on this plane. You may have heard me say that a number of times, but I want you to understand it one day. To understand this is a truth You are being allowed to live this task called life because he is legitimizing eternity. We do not have a father that plans on having little robots for the rest of eternity. Let's look at something here. Can we turn to Proverbs 3, 11, 1 to 13? Who finds wisdom? My son, do not despise Yah's discipline or be weary of his reproof. Is anybody finding religious environments we sometimes despise the Father's wisdom? And, and how many people do you see rejoice in reproof? Who here rejoices truly? Or appreciates being reproved or corrected by another brother or sister. For Yah reproves whom he loves. You mean that as parents, who parents you love your kids? 
when you're giving them discipline and correction, is that love or uh, uh, not love? See, if you're the shadow picture, the Father is loving us apparently through the act of discipline and correction and reproof. So you mean that as we experience this in the shadow picture, he might be doing it to us? Now, I've been a little bit harder hearing than probably most of you in this room, so I've experienced the truth of this, this one. But it's let me understand the truth of that one. But eventually, the Father's not into correction and reproof for the sake of it. He wants us to what? To grow up and to learn and whatnot. Just because we don't enjoy, do you think that the Father rejoices in reproving? Not sure I can find that one in Scripture. But I can tell you, he says it's love that does. So if you're experiencing the Father in someone else, Yeshua, the maturing of the body, and that person is bringing a little bit of correction or reproof, is it possible the Father could be using them to do that through them? Is it possible our character might get tested while that's happening? Has anybody here ever been offended when somebody's reproofing or correcting you from the body? It's hard, isn't it? I don't want to hear this. I don't know about this. And, it, and it's hard, especially when you know they're wrong and you're right. <laughs> and that can happen. That's when your character really gets tested. It's not necessarily always whether we're right and wrong. In fact, I have found a lot of times, being the receiver or a giver of that over the years in the body, that sometimes you often find out actually there was two sides to this story and there was a little bit you needed to really know and hear on both fronts. And I've often found, whether I was being reproved or reproving, that actually the story wasn't quite understood until there was a little bit of fellowship, till there was a little bit of listening to someone else and hearing them and them hearing you. And then all of a sudden, you know, I've been in situations where we're both going, okay, maybe we're actually both need to actually hear and, and revisit the Father's ways. As the Father of the Son in whom he delights. So who here wants the Father to reprove them? <laughs> Come on, hands up. But the Father wants to correct you. Yeah. That's because he loves you and he's going to delight in you. Isn't this a beautiful thing? So we say to the children... We love them. We delight them. Do you know, when my mom used to give me a spanking when I was young, and I didn't need many because I was a fantastic child. No, I didn't. But those rare occasions when it happened, do you know what she used to do after I got a spanking? She used to give me a hug while I was busy screaming at her how much she didn't love me. And she used to give me a hug and say, I love you. It did not change the consequence and it did not change the discipline that was required. But I never, ever, as I was screaming and crying in my room and trying to get all sorts of attention, never once did the thought enter into my mind that she didn't love me. But it did not change what I was about to experience. And look how I turned out. (laughs) Blessed is the one who finds wisdom which is what the Kohilath has really been trying to give us in, these, in this incredible book. And the one who gets understanding. So sometimes we hear something, but does that mean we always understand it? No. Okay. In Genesis 3.19... This is going back into the garden. Lots of interesting things happening there. By the way, I believe a lot of misunderstood things in the body. But we're just going to deal with the simple fact of the father's about to tell them, okay, make it very clear to them that what? That the shadow picture is temporary, vapor. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. You're no longer just going to have the trees producing this fruit for you. Till you return to the ground, out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Simply, your shadow picture will come to an end. All of us. Learn the lessons from the donkey in that video. Whatever it is that you have in your life, be it a loved one, family member, whatever it is, You may not be able to get them to see 
the perspective the Father has shown you. But what you can do is you can do your part. And not hold it against somebody because they're not reacting the way you think they should. It's our hearts that are going to be judged when this is all over. And we're going to look at that. Fools despise knowledge and wisdom. (laughs) I've been a fool a lot of my life. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. Who spoke to par- in parables to the masses? Yeah. Was he speaking wisdom? Yes. But it was gobbledygook to some. To others, the mysteries of the task and the plans of the Father and his mighty plan of salvation was being unlocked. The fear of Yah is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Children? Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So when your parents are speaking to you, they're giving you wisdom and instruction. And that is love. Yes. Hear, my son, your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teachings. We learned in last chapter of the Kehilath, that we were instructed as a part of the Shema being in our lives that parents were to, in the morning, teach there. Yeah, and at night, before we lie down. Isn't this interesting? This is the instructions to the parents to do this in the Father's ways. Not the pastor, not the teacher, not the evangelist, not the rabbi, not the whatever it is that we want to call it out there. Who's supposed to be doing this morning and night with their kids? The parents. That great shadow picture there happening in the family unit just regarding Deuteronomy 6, in chapter 6. That is the Father in the weightier matter doing with us the same thing. So we don't want to despise the Father's instruction. But if I don't have a reverence of my Creator, my Elohim, If I don't have that reverence, is it possible that I might despise the very instructions that it's giving me? Have you ever seen any believers despise what is written in the front of the book? I'm just going to say that I believe that that could be a reverence issue. They've forgotten that they're dealing with the creator. Their creator and the creator of all things and everyone you see. That has, that deserves reverence. But if we forget that reverence, is it possible that I might despise some of the very instructions in it? And it's the same thing, children, if, uh, to your parents and parents to your children, if they do not reverence the parents, if you're first trying to be a friend and not a parent, You're going to get this order wrong. Be a parent first so that you can be friends later. If they don't understand the reverence of the rules of your household and the instructions and the greater wisdom which you're giving, if they do not get this, they will not have a reverence to you. And if they don't have a reverence to you, they're going to end up making a lot of foolish decisions later on. Anybody here made foolish decisions? We have a chance to give a different generation something, no matter how crazy the world thinks it is, right? Is is Rome going to tell us how to raise our families? Do you want the government to tell you how to raise your family? Do you want somebody that could not even care less about the instructions of the wisdom of the Creator to tell you how to raise your family? This is happening. I love how this goes there. Remember the challenge I give you? You're going to find the marriage covenant language everywhere. How possibly could this relate to a marriage covenant? Let's just keep reading. And your mother's teaching. Or they, or, or they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Do you know that that's bridal speak in ancient Hebrew context? The tiara's being put on her and the, the pendant, the necklace around her neck. We don't have rings and... In the father's economy scale, that's very Greek and European. But in the true wedding, you're looking at it. Now, if that said ring, you would all automatically in the Western concept go, 
Oh, that's speaking ready, right? But it's there. Do you know what that is? Just read this. If you have a reverence and you accept the reproof and correction and forsake not his instructions and teachings, you could be the recipient of what? Being the bride of Messiah. Has anybody seen that in Proverbs 1, 6 to 9? Would you have even gone there to understand that? Okay, we'll keep moving. Too much of my life never saw that. Ever. (laughs) Praise Yah for everyone's patience, especially dealing with me. I have far too much to give an account for. Okay. We'll keep reading here. Pick up back up in verse 5. Furthermore, they are afraid of what is high and what is low places in the way. And the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper becomes a burden and desire perishes. Does anybody notice that some of your desires, the older you get, start to perish? Remember what you used to think was really cool in your youth? It's not so cool now? Hmm. For a man is going to his everlasting home, and the mourners shall go out on the streets. Do the donkeys come out in the morning there in our video clip? Yeah. So there's a place for the funeral to acknowledge those we've walked with and to loved along the ways. Remember him. Who's him? Yeah. Elohim. Remember him before the silver cord is loosed or the golden bowl is broken or the jar shattered at the fountain or the wheel broken at the well. The body and the spirit being disconnected. Remember him before that day. (laughs) You have a chance now with each other, with his word, with Everything that you're experiencing in the shadow picture, this the Kohileth is telling you, remember this day before the cord is snapped. And we don't know when that is for any of us. Boy, I, I, yeah, I, it is so sobering to read this to any of you and to even expose, uh, give an expository on it because... You know, it's this is, I am speaking right now to me, okay? Know that. I'm having to take this in and remember Curtis before the golden, you know, the silver cord snaps. You understand? There's me too in here. These are the words to me and to you. I just get to play the preaching bit right now. But this is sobering for me reading this. Just for any of you, if you're wondering. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to Elohim who gave it. Vapor, vapor. Pick it up in verse 8. Vapor, vapor, said the Kohileth. All is vapor. And besides being wise, the the Kohileth also taught the people knowledge. And he listened and sought out and set in order many proverbs. I think he used to say that King Solomon spoke over 3,000 proverbs. Who would like to be able to, to go to someone that could actually speak out 3,000 proverbs that actually had the Father's wisdom in them? That'd be pretty, that, that'd be some neat fellowship, don't you think? The Kohila sought out to find out the words, the light and the words of truth Rightly written. And the words of the wise are like goads and as nails driven by the masters of collection. And they were given by one shepherd. Who's the shepherd? Any guesses? Yeshua. Isn't that Nate? He's right here. And besides these, my son, be warned, the making of many books has no end, and much study is a wearying of the flesh. I'm just going to pause there for a second. 
Hey, you all heard me talk a little bit about Talmud, right? And we get familiar with Jewish Talmud. And I often reference Christian Talmud, don't I? When I say that, just to make it very clear, and I keep saying, I know most of you in this room know, but for those listening on uh, on an audio version of this somewhere, just to be very aware, when I say Talmud, I am meaning in its basic form the precepts and teaching of men. Whenever we teach or produce anything, we are producing Talmud. Okay? The question is, there is much good Jewish Talmud, by the way. You'll find some very good understanding of the Father in Jewish Talmud. You ever heard somebody say, oh, Jewish Talmud's all bad? No, it's not. But there's also some stuff in there that's not great. Christian Talmud. Is there some good stuff in some of the Christian teachings? Is there some truth in some of those Christian teachings? Yeah. But there's a lot of stuff that isn't. You see, in the end, my precepts or teaching are going to either align with his truths in the end or not. Who here would like your Talmud to start reflecting the Father's truth as you move forward in your life? Yeah? This is what we are doing. And this is why Yeshua patterned what he did in discipleship. So that iron would sharpen iron, that we would understand, that we would walk a journey of some accountability, that we would actually work through this. Is anybody here, if you were sharing your faith now, would it look a little bit different from five years ago? Would you say that your sharing of your faith is more in line with his truth or less? Yeah. But scripture tells us that every idle word will even be held to account on the judgment seat. Can you imagine how much trouble I'm in? And you all are going to be there at my Bema seat defending me. (laughs) Okay. Think about that. Is there a reason why every word, all of this, and why even teachers in particular are held to a, a greater account? Is it possible it's because we're held a bit more responsible as to whether we taught the Father's truth or not? Is that possible? And every word needs to be held to account in the sense? Oh, we listen to the teachers and the the pastors and the preachers and all this kind of thing. And we think, oh, you know, everything they say has to be. It's truth. Meanwhile, we're not living in an environment where we're reading the word for ourselves. And with others and walking in an accountable place. Has anybody here been misled by a particular teaching or something you read or book or DVD? Have you ever explained? And then later the father said, look, that wasn't quite on. That doesn't mean that person was necessarily trying to lead you astray. So this isn't about we go and start and attacking all the flesh and blood shadow picture, is it? It's about us getting on and understanding the Father's ways, living the way he wanted us to, so we have more and more of a chance to live a life where his truth will be coming through us. You don't get to blame everyone else when this is over. So he teaches us, the more we, the more we grow up and mature and everything else, we've got to spend a little bit more time looking in what? The mirror. The mirror. Not just being able to point the finger. You remember as soon as Adam was, you know, Adam and Eve had fallen in the separation. Do you remember what, what the words were coming out of Elohim? And he's saying, you know, what's, he's basically questioning what's going on here. As if he didn't know. It's a rhetorical question. Of course he knew it happened. But he's going to make Adam answer it. And what does Adam do? What was the first thing that came out of him in a fallen state? It was the woman you gave me. <laughs> Was he willing to take accountability in that moment? No. This is interesting. He didn't stop at her, did he? What else did he say in that moment? The woman you gave me. He managed to blame Elohim and her. Wow. Has anybody here blamed Elohim and someone else for something in your life? Oh, I bet you have. And if you've forgotten, don't worry. You sure will remind you when you stand in front of him. 
So it's okay. Whatever memory loss we might have, it'll be brought back to us. <laughs> However, it's in good hands. And we must, when we get this, we must understand that we are in the best hands we could ever be with our Creator and with the blood that's bought us and with an understanding of His truth. We are in the only hands you want to be in. And whenever you feel yourself get a little bit self-righteous or self-abasing, know you're on the throne. You're sitting in self-sovereign position whether you're judging yourself or judging others. And none of your judgment upon yourself or others is going to be very impressive on the day you stand in front of Yeshua. For all of us. Okay. So again, when I'm, when I'm just mentioning Talmud, and as you do, let us not mistake. This isn't, this isn't about attacking the flesh and our brothers and sisters or whatever it is that we're trying to do to help the body grow. we just got to know that if the Father hasn't spoken it, there's a potential for us to get a little thing, something out of context. Is that fair? So we want him in us shaping the battleground of the mind and our understanding. We want his wisdom, not man's. Let us hear the conclusion. So we pick it up in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter. Okay, when all is said and done. Now look where the Kohilath goes. Surprise, surprise. Fear Elohim and guard his commands. For this applies to all mankind. Whoa. When all is said and done, when this is going to be over, and you know it is, what is the Kohila saying to you? Have reverence to your Creator and honor His commands. You mean He pointed to the Shema, to Deuteronomy 6. Wow. This is where He's gone. Where did Yeshua go when He was being challenged? What does this all mean, Master? Yeshua, what's this all about? How did he answer? He quoted them Deuteronomy. Do you remember that? A lot of us don't realize that when we're just reading the New Testament and we never read the front of the book, that he was actually quoting the instructions given to us in Deuteronomy 6. So you mean the Kohileth, the wisest flesh that has ever lived, then Yeshua himself, our Messiah in the flesh, right? And then... The Torah and Moses, what he was written. So let me get this straight. Yeshua, King Solomon, and Moses are all giving you different advice? The exact same advice. Do you think that's three people we might want to take seriously? In the shadow picture? Three witnesses. Absolutely it is. It's neat that you said that. We're going to finish with the scripture here. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. Who's that speaking to? Is that some things? All things. Yeah, look at something here. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This will bring us home on this, and hopefully we'll be able to finish the journey of the Kohileth. I'm actually... Uh, I'll read this first. Genesis 2, 8, 9. And Yahweh Elohim planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Okay? So, first garden, and then who came? Man. And out of the ground, Yahweh Elohim made to spring up every tree. So, is he the producer of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil? And the tree of life. Okay? That is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So what trees are in the midst of the garden? Read that as you're not going to miss them. They're not stuck up in some corner. <laughs> Figuratively speaking. If he's going to put something in the midst, do you think there was, what is, he's, is he a silly Elohim? 
You mean he's made this first, stuck them right where no one can miss them, and then he puts man in there? That can change your whole Christian perspective when you start to work this one out. Why would he do that? And then he slapped his Elohim forehead when something went wrong. Oh, why did I do that? Really? Do we really think that the Creator was surprised at all at what went down? See, we need to understand this in its proper context so then we can investigate a matter in its proper context. Is that fair? And this is what a lot of the teachings that I received and grew up over there, it didn't allow me to look the way I should have been taught to look, to be able to critically think and to learn the Hebraic way of asking the questions, to receive this, to iron sharpens iron, the the, the pattern of discipleship. It's been robbed from us. We've learned a system that says, shut up and listen, you're in the classroom. That's not a Hebraic model. A break model means that everybody gets off the bench and plays the game. Do you understand? The only time you're not playing is if the coach benches you. I've been benched in my life spiritually. <laughs> I've experienced that. And I wanted to be back out on the field. <laughs> I wanted to, you know, Father, just get me back in the game. No, you'll shut up and listen for a while. We're all going to experience maybe being benched or reproved and correct by the Father. He promises us such a thing. But it's okay. There's a time for that too. And it's needed. But we look at this tree of this knowledge of good and evil. And I'm just going um, to steal something from my dear brother um, uh, from Steve Berkson. Because uh, brother Steve and I, we were doing this, and he shared a list that he had uh, put together regarding the tree of the knowledge of the good and evil. And I just loved it as a part of some of our madrash. And so I wanted to share this a little bit and try and put it in the context in which I think Scripture is trying to relay this. Because this descriptive or adjectives or of actions and behavior, because this is really going to come down to our behavior. Okay? Let me just read this. If this is the Yeshua end, okay, the good end, and this is the evil end of the, you know, the Hasatan end, the office of Hasatan, let's just start off here. Unconditional love in the good, so what is that in the evil? Conditional love. So let's just kind of now play this out, okay, as I go ahead. So joy... On the good side, on the evil side, we've got unhappiness, depression, misery. Having a peaceful character. What's the other side? Agitated, combative, argument, angry. Self seeks restoration. One seeks restoration. The other causes strife and dissension. Obedience, submission. Disobedience and dominance on the other end. Patience equals versus impatience. Kind, compassionate, merciful versus unkind, mean, merciless, uncompassionate. Good, decent, moral integrity. Wicked, indecent, deceitful. Trustworthy, mature. Untrustworthy, unreliable, immature. Gentle and considerate. Rough, harsh, and inconsiderate. Self-controlled discipline versus unstable, rash, and undisciplined. Selfless versus selfish behavior. Generous versus stingy. Outward focused, others focused. Versus inwardly focused or self-focused. Does anybody know that the younger we are, we generally tend to be focused on who? Yeah. Spiritually, is it possible that's a great shadow picture? If I don't mature, who am I going to be focused on? These are real indicators of where you're really at if you start to get and understand this whole knowledge of the tree of good and evil. Satisfied and content versus desire, lust, craving, insatiable. I've got to have it. Clean, tahor, versus unclean, tamay. Lawful versus lawless. 
Truth versus lies. Life versus death. Modest versus immodest. Humble and meek versus arrogant, stubborn and stiff-necked. Fearless versus fear-led. Faith and trust versus fear and doubt. Led by the Spirit, what the Father wants. Or you're led by pride and ego, what I want. And to sum it all up, we have his shalom or we will have our anxiety. What was there no room for? Yeah. I've added that in there. But I thought Steve did a good job in saying some of the characters of this. But we've got to look at this now as a tree of life, but we've got a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of the knowledge of good and evil has both of these things. So what's with this tree of life? <sighs> I'm going to suggest... Actually, I'll go back to this one. In the tree of life in the garden here, just going back to Genesis 2, 8, 9, the tree of life, etz chalim. <laughs> oh, it's pathetic. My Hebrew pronunciation always, always struggles. But this etz chalim <laughs> is an adjective. Feminine noun, can be masculine noun. It's a common name also for the Jewish yeshivas and synagogues. Interesting. But did it come to life? What is fascinating about this is that, that its primary here in the tree of life is actually with a feminine noun. Do you know that the Ruach or the Holy Spirit is often associated with the feminine noun? This is interesting. Is it possible, if we go back to this list of the tree of knowledge, good and evil, is it possible that if the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh, comes into this picture, is it possible that it can bring to life this side of our understanding? Because if we gain the understanding of the knowledge of good and evil, we're now going to be in a very different position. So now that that's in both of us, which side do we want to live on? We want to live on the good, yeah. So the only thing that can bring this to life, the very fruit of this, is going to be given by the tree of life. We are in the state we're in, but the antidote is actually his spirit operating in our lives because this is the fruit and the character, the very character of our being, which will start to come forth with a circumcised heart. You can pretend any of the list of the good of the knowledge of the tree of good and evil at any time. That doesn't mean it's going on in your heart. Or I can look good at a Shabbat. Or I can look good at a dinner. Or I can look good visiting my... You can do all of that. But is that what comes out of you when things aren't going your way? Is this what you really see? Because if we get a circumcised heart, if the tree of life can bring to us the antidote of this spirit and flesh warring, in our lives, if it can actually bring the antidote into this, we will start to see the fruit of the, and in the Brit Hadashah, it's known as the fruit of the Spirit. And you're going to see all of these things contained to one degree or another in it. I just like the more of the detail breakdown that Steve had done there, and he'd done a good job. So if you're listening, Steve, I've plagiarized and stole from you. Actually, he knows I was going to do that. Okay. When all is said and done, the Kohila said to us, what? Hear, O Israel, Yah, our Elohim, Yah is one. You shall love your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 5. Some of you may have heard me say this, but I love doing it. You know, you know that question, you know, the, what's the meaning of life? Right? And we ask it like, there's no way it can be known. It's, in a, it's just this question that can't be understood. Yet, the word itself actually gives us the meaning of life. The task of life. What the Kohilas challenged us all to, in fact, indeed gave us a right, all to be experiencing it right now. By the way, you're in it. You didn't choose to be here. He chose you to be here. You're in it right now, all of us. This Shabbat. 
tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, until he says you're no longer in it. And in that moment, he's saying to you, this is the reason why that we may learn to love him with all our heart and all our soul and all our might. Now, do we want our definition on the Shema or his? Yes. You see, if I can reinvent him in our own image, and Chris is going to speak a bit more about this next week, I might be making up even how to apply the very Shema in my life. Because this is what my God looks like. This is what my Jesus looks like. This is what my Yeshua looks like. Whatever it is, we need his image. We need his truth to understand the fulfillment of that. And this is the journey of really maturing and growing. I view things the more mature that I become in the shadow picture spiritually, the different understanding and intimacy I have of my creator. Is that fair? And therefore, this incredible thing, the reason for life itself, has so much more meaning moving forward. Because I don't have to define how to fulfill that. I need to learn what it looks like to him. And then do it his way, not mine. And when Yeshua said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he meant it. If you think you can get to that place, your way, your denominational whatever, your Talmud, your whatever views, I'm sorry, you can't. There is one way. And he's made that clear in the word. We need to discover what that one way is. We are going to awake from this. And the Kehilah finishes up here. So we'll finish in verse 14. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, including all that is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. So all that has been done in your task. In John 5, 22, 23, it's quite sobering here in the Brit. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to who? You ever heard there's the judgment seat, you know, and then the guy with the white beard and everything is going to sit down at the great white throne judgment and he's going to be the one that deals with the rest of it? Get this right. How much judgment has been given to the Son? All. Oh, we will be in front of Yeshua, whether we're awoken with his blood covering us or whether we awake to it not. We will stand in front of the one who did and had the right to purchase us all. That simple. All that may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. By the way, who's speaking here in John 5, 23? Yeah, say it louder. Yeah. These are the words of your king. He's the one saying it. All that may honor the son, just as they honor... Ooh, just as they honor the father. Wait a minute, what's the only thing that exists? What we call the Old Testament, the Tanakh. This is a big deal. All that may honor the son, just as they honor the father. Whoa. Whoa. Whoever does not honor the Son, now he's just defined how the Son's going to be honored. All those who do not honor the Son does not honor the Father. Whoa, who sent him? Do you think that there is a clear message for us to maybe go back and revisit the foundations of our faith? And is it almost everywhere in Scripture that we need to understand this, that how this all actually works? Because I want to finish up here with the final... So the statement here, the spirit, the water, and the blood. In 1 John 5, 6 to 7, it says, For there are three that testify, the spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree. How many witnesses to establish a matter? Okay. This is interesting. You all know your spirit beings, right? You all know that the life's in the blood. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. We've got an interesting thing going on here. This is pointing both to the totality of what you're going to be experiencing in the shadow picture. And these three are going to testify to your task. 
Now, I want his spirit, I want his living water, and I want his blood to go over my life. Do you get it? Uh, so you get to live in your spirit, you're going to live your task, and believe me, your blood is not going to achieve anything. You want to get caught up in endless genealogies and disputing, I'm from the tribe of this, or I'm that, or whatever else it is? Our blood in here doesn't purchase anything. His does. These three agree. His spirit, his living water, his blood. And they are all testifying to what has been a part and covering and in your journey of this task we call life. Do you understand? You are in safe, safe hands in all of this. And we have to have faith and trust in that because nobody here can prevent the day that we're all going to what? We're going to die. But we have got something that has tricked us into living a shadow picture and focused on the shadow picture. We are focused on a shadow picture which makes us look at the past. We are focused on a shadow picture so much it makes us try and live the future, doesn't it? As if we can know. And yet the Father is saying, in the shadow picture, I want you to focus on your day-to-day journey and let my word be a lamp unto your feet. Let that actually be the thing because I want you to have an eternal perspective Okay, in the weightier matter, and a present perspective in the shadow picture. Do you see that position? If you start to walk out of the present position, is it possible it could attack your eternal perspective or understanding? Because you're now going to be focused on what? All the things that choke out your life. Remember the parable of the sower of the seed? Did the weeds come up and choke them out? Because they were focused on the things or the worries or the cares of this world. Or distracted by them. Or they weren't in discipleship and his truth could never take root. All of this shadow picture was robbing them of an understanding of an eternal perspective. The words of the Koheleth in (laughs) finish your task. Paul actually said to finish the race well, didn't he? To encourage each other to do that. Let's finish our task well. But know this, it's temporary. Our task is temporary. But still finish it well. Does it have meaning? Did we learn over this whole book that our temporary task in life, our vapor, does it have meaning? Yes or no? Yes, it does. That means everybody else's vapor in here or task has meaning too. Not just yours. But he wants us to have the right perspective of how to see this. Do we have our priorities where they should be? Do we understand the temporary nature of what it is you are experiencing in life? Because if we can really get this, the weeds aren't going to choke us anymore. The anxiety is not going to consume and grip our lives. We're going to start to walk forward and actually understand there is a blood that has bought us to understand and know who he is. And to have that intimacy, to make a choice that will ultimately result in the circumcision of our lives, of our hearts, all of us. And then we head for a Bema seat. Who here wants a circumcised heart before we stand in front of them? Yeah. So let's keep our eyes where they should be in the shadow picture. And let's have our weightier understanding on the plan he's revealed. The great mystery. And know and trust that we are in incredible hands. We are in an amazing, amazing, amazing plan here. And we're only just... We're just touching, just scratching the surface of how big and incredible this really is. And the more that I grow and understand and try and mature and and all of these things and his understanding of his word, the more I realize I don't know, but the more excited I become with what he's revealed. Has anybody experienced that? Yeah. Let's praise Yah for that, right? And let's thank him that we're all here today, despite what we've done, experienced, done in our tasks. Let's just praise him, literally. Somehow, we are here this day discussing these matters, despite us. Now, that's something worth praising the Father for and the very blood that bought us. Amen? Amen. Okay, all right. Well, let's finish up there. And the journey of the Kohilath, at least for this round, is over. Thanks very much.